Welcome back to the Wolf of Queen Street podcast series. Welcome back on the audio podcast or the YouTube series if you're watching today. Um, this podcast is about entrepreneurs having their say and then talk about their stories, their success, their failures, and how they've achieved the goals that they've set out for themselves today and in the future. Today, I'm joined by Sally Illenworth from Illenworth Media. And this young lady has achieved more in the last five years than most of us would like to achieve in the next 15 to 20 years. I just take a bit of a backstory to introduce Sally. She has become the king and queen of LinkedIn and LinkedIn content over the last 18 months to two years. But not only that, she also was one of the youngest franchisees, or I think she was the one of the youngest franchisees owners in Australia at the age of 18, and how she's transitioned that knowledge which you learned from that business into the content game of LinkedIn today, where her organic reach in the last couple of years have been more than 26 million views organically without having to pay a cent. So just understand that she's reached, her content has reached over 26 million eyes and she hasn't paid a cent. So welcome to the show, Sally, and I'm excited to have you. Thanks for having me, Lawrence. I'm excited to be here. So we were talking a little bit about off air and saying, I was saying to Sally that in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, I'd seen Sally's um, content the whole time on my LinkedIn feed. So to anyone that's not aware or has been living under a rock, obviously LinkedIn was founded, let's say 10, 20 years ago when it was, I think it's less than 20, ago, 20 years ago, but it was originally founded as a sort of a job site, social media. You went in there to put up your CV, you went in there to find a job, but it has evolved quite a bit in the last sort of three to five years when people have lost that edge of, I've got to be professional. All right, five years ago, if you're recording content, you were doing anything, I should have been in a suit and tie and that was the way the professional world has worked. LinkedIn has lost that edge now, so it's become a little bit more store, business-focused social media platform, but it's got a bit of a more edgy vibe, a more modern vibe, so that there's growth in it and people coming towards it to actually read and watch content like you would do on a Facebook side without being uh, butchered by sponsorships and ads and so far. So it's quite a nice and a clean way to watch content. As I said, I'd seen Sally over the last 12 to 18 months, and I thought, hold on, I need to reach out and see what her story was. And as I said, Sally, 18 years old, you got yourself on top of a, what's a crust gourmet pizzas as a franchisee owner at 18, and you ran it for a good few years. So before we get into LinkedIn, I've got to ask you, at 18, franchise owner, what were you thinking? Yeah, I've, in hindsight, I think I had no idea. I think at the time I was certainly more confident about yep. the situation. Um, and I think that's just the beauty of it for me at the time, based on how I'd started my career and where I was at, it was sort of the next logical mm -hmm. step. So when the opportunity came up, it was sort of made sense. So, oh yeah, I'll go and do that because I'd started at a, a store level working for another franchisee mm -hmm. in Sydney, Australia. Um, and so I was working for them in a customer service role. Um, and then quickly I sort of took on some management roles and so forth. Um, and then so when the opportunity came up to become a franchisee, I thought, yeah, I'll do it. And the brand had asked me and they said, oh, do you want to launch the brand in Darwin Northern Territory? Because I'd lived there prior and I still mm -hmm. had family there. And so I said, yeah, sure. I said, I don't really have any money, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Um, so that was interesting, a very, really, really good experience in and of itself, um, you know, particularly going through the exercise of trying to go, okay, well, I want to open a business, but I don't necessarily have money. Yep. Um, so, you know, how can we bankroll this thing? How can we get some money? So we came to a few arrangements on that, sorted that out. Um, and I remember at the time when we were opening the business, it was delayed by three, three and a half months. So, you know, you go through significant amounts of stress and, um, being that age, it was quite difficult in the sense that everyone else my age that I knew just wasn't living a life like that, mm -hmm. if you like. So it was very, very hard to sort of relate in that sense. We used to be like, oh, you know, how's your day been? It's like, oh, yeah, just, you know, just at uni, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm spending all this money, the business is not even open, and oh, my God, yeah, I had this problem, and this supplier screwed up, and, you know, we've got asbestos in the building and all that sort of stuff. So it was quite full on. Um, and, but at the time, regardless as to how stressful it got, I was just like, oh, that's right. I'll give it a go and just give it my best shot. That's the best anyone could do in any situation. Yep. I think. So, you th yeah. I, yeah. Do you think, you know, taken from that, you know, it was something I brought up in a previous episode in the sense of we've got this modern theme of business owner to entrepreneur. As much as you are publicly an entrepreneur and you are now in what you're achieving and what you're offering, you think 
the experiences and the learnings you took from being a business owner at that stage in a franchisee gave you some further step ups on other people of your age or in your niche as you went in from being, you know, owning that franchisee into a content market and social media market and social platform market as you are today? Oh, certainly. I mean, there's, you know, there's so much throughout that experience um, or any experience similar to that. Um, you know, everything you learn in those scenarios, you, you can't go and read out of a book, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can certainly learn a lot of the principles and a lot of like the, the concepts, if you like, by reading or studying. Um, but to be in a real business environment, particularly at that age, going through those experiences that are only hypothetical in a book, yep. uh, you know, nothing can really replace that experience. So in that sense, I suppose you could call it a step up. Um, particularly in terms of venturing into other spaces. I think one of the biggest things that you, well, I learned during that experience that has certainly helped me now and is a massive, um, you know, competitive advantage, if you like, that I have is that very quickly you learn to become okay with the concept of things not going to plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I think particularly from a young age, we're conditioned to think that, you know, we finish school, we might go to university and so forth, and we make these big plans. And our expectation is that those plans are going to be realized and that yep. they're going to happen the way we want them to happen. So the sooner you can sort of learn and become okay with the fact that usually plan A is going to become a very adapted version of itself. Mm-hmm. If not, it might become plan X or something yep. like that. Um, and that applies in any given scenario. So whether or not you're an entrepreneur, business owner, uh, an employee, it doesn't matter. Um, so at the end of the day, I know that has certainly helped me a lot. Um, because it's just taught me to become very, very adaptive um, and not get, you know, frustrated or not get discouraged when things aren't going to plan and instead just try and become a little bit more okay with the fact that this is right, this is, we're just adapting, we're pivoting, we're moving, yep. we'll eventually get there. We might have to do a few detours, but we'll eventually get there. So, yeah, I, I love having learned that and experienced that firsthand, although at the time it didn't feel that pleasant or I wasn't that grateful to be learning it. Um, but certainly in hindsight, I can see now how that plays out and influences the way I approach everything. So, Yeah. So, I mean, whether, whether it was a success, a failure, whether it was learning or anything, but fundamentally is whether, you know, if you look at it in sense of going, the worst case, it was a failure. But if you failed forward and took the learnings from it, you can only be better off today or the last couple of years from that experience. And that seems like what you're saying at the moment, that as much as that time where you're under it, you didn't like the pressure or the learnings you were, but when you look back at now, it's become a, fun, a fundamental part of your foundation to, to your business yeah. etiquette and the way you work today. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I think that's something that, you know, everyone should, um, you know, want to learn or want mm. to learn to become okay with. Because really, you know, even beyond the, I suppose, professional landscape, so outside of business, you know, even in your personal mm-hmm. life, that same thinking applies where things don't always go to plan. And as such, you need to learn to become okay with that yep. um, and embrace it as best you can. Yes, get frustrated. Yes, get, you know, a little bit, um, you know, um, maybe upset in some scenarios or you feel stressed out. That's okay. Um, but understanding that's very much a part of the process because everything changes so quickly. Um, you know, I know when I opened that business, for example, my I had a 10-year plan. It was like a nine, 10-year mm-hmm. plan. So I had first rights for the whole of that sort of territory in Australia. And I'd already mapped out, you know, we can put another store here, designed all the territories, drawn out the maps. And I was like, okay, this is a nine, 10-year plan. I'm going to open three to four sites. And then, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell these two together and I'll sell the other two by themselves. Um, and that's the plan. And then once I finish that, I'll figure out what I want to do with my career. Um, because remembering at this point, I hadn't actually thought about what I wanted to do. It was just sort of mm-hmm. seamless when I started working, I was at school and so forth. So, you know, realizing that things can change, uh, you know, particularly in business, like at the end of the day, you're operating in you know macro landscape. Like there's so many factors influencing what happens. Um, and in some scenarios, unfortunately, everything can look great on paper. But then when you actually get into the real environment, yep. um, unfortunately, things don't go that way or something happens in terms of the way consumers are behaving or, you know, that, for example, in Gawa Northern Territory, it's very uh, vulnerable to um, the government just based mm-hmm. on how small the population is and so forth. You know, so one decision by the government, which impacts the entire sort of, uh, you know, like contractual industry up there, if you like will significantly impact, um, you know, a consumer business that's not yep. selling necessities like a pizza shop. So, learning to deal with those things and also just learning to become very, very mindful and conscious of everything else that's going on outside your four walls Mm -hmm. and not getting stuck in tunnel vision thinking that, 
oh, we're just going to focus on what's going on in here and that's going to work. I mean, just you need to have consideration to everything else. So, um, yeah, learning all of that has been yeah, very, very uh, powerful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> At the time, probably pissed me off a bit, but powerful, I'd say, in hindsight. So just as a bit of a humor, um, if anyone watches Sally on her social media, by all means, especially on the Instagram game, she plays hard, uh, she works hard, but plays hard. So most of the time in the evening, she's still working till late hours, but there's always a glass of wine. There's always a music yeah. going on. Most mornings, there's always a really bad dance routine. Sorry, Sally. Uh, it's pretty much a bad dance, as most people dance in the month, is, um, to take that edge off and take that, you know, that, that pressure off in the moment. Because that, that, the experience you've spoken about now is sort of two years behind you, but now you're obviously in the LinkedIn game and you're producing content and talking about the journey. I think at the moment most of your workshops and your seminars, you talk about people producing one piece of content a day on LinkedIn to be able to reach the organic market. Yeah. So you're having to push every single day in yourself. And it's great to see that someone that's push and pressurized at least has a off switch at some stage. And it's like I said, I think you did a video the last couple of days. I think it was two days ago and you had a, you did a video and it was three different laptops with three different pieces of content, but I'm sure yeah. it was music and wine at all times. So it was, it was great to see that. It right, and it- Sometimes, you know, particularly when you're, say you are building a business or whatever the scenario, yep. maybe you're, you know, studying at university and working three jobs to try and, you know, survive if you like. Um, you know, there's, there's always going to be pressure. Uh, there's always going to be stress. Um, mm-hmm. You know, how we experience it as an individual is going to be, you know, contextually relevant um, and just depends on what we're like as an individual. But I think, um, you know, easily we sort of create this negative idea around stress and pressure. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's not necessarily because we believe it, but because we're told in society, you know, you don't want to be stressed and so forth. Um, So what happens is if we start to feel an element of stress or pressure, we start to think, oh, I must be doing something wrong or, you know, this is not good. And then we start to really over catastrophize the idea in our heads, um, which impacts how we actually move forward and the decisions we make. So, you know, learning to accept that stress and pressure are really a part of any process. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can find ways to manage, you know, pressure and stress, um, then you're really in a very good position because it's only in those scenarios that you actually really learn to adapt, right? Because you're being pushed beyond your yep. comfort. Um, so you're going, okay, well, shit, I really need to think about this here. You know, this is quite stressful. So, and then at the same time, learning to have fun along the way, regardless as to how stressed you might be. Mm-hmm. So for me, that is, you know, I'll dance around like an idiot for a little bit, you know, <laughs> always have music going on, uh, you know, do lip syncing videos on the likes of Instagram. I've put quite a few out on LinkedIn, um, particularly in the early days, because you know, it's sort of just that reminder to people that, yes, you know, be serious. Yes, be good at what you do. Yes, be, you know, professional in terms of wherever you're delivering and serving people. Um, but you've, you've got to have fun at the end of the day as well. You know, I think I put a photo out on LinkedIn oh, maybe two weeks ago. Um, and it was with um, a, a client and we were sort of, you know, posing stupidly in the photo. Um, and, you know, the way I wrote the copy was to try and highlight people and just take the piss of, out of what professionalism actually means, you know. Yeah. And one of the things I threw in there was something to the effect of that, you know, like it, it's okay to have fun because like outside of the boardroom, we're all human at the end yeah. of the day. Um, and I think it can become quite toxic for people if they get into this mindset where they think they can't have fun or be silly um, and let that side of them come out um, in pursuit of, you know, building a business or building their career. So, yeah, you, you got to have fun. And you got to learn to, my brother taught me actually when I was, when we were younger. He said to me, if you can't laugh at yourself, how can you laugh at anyone else? I said, oh, that's a pretty good mic. So now I always do my best to make myself laugh at myself. Yeah. Um, so that then I sort of have the uh, permission to go and laugh at other people. <laughs> Sounds good. You know, so as you said, talking about LinkedIn and being, you know, not being so serious. So obviously 18 months ago, you transitioned, come into the LinkedIn space, obviously looking to start on the path we are today. Where was the sort of stage, you know, we realized, hold on, there's a massive gap and that gap still to anyone that's listening. The door is not just, it's not just open a little bit. The organic reach and growth on LinkedIn is still wide open. I don't know how long, so you better get on the game right now, yeah. but it's still yeah. there today without having to boost, sponsor, do anything. How did, yeah. when did you realize that moment going, holy shit, Facebook's been killed, Instagram's been killed, unless you've you know, been in for five years, that going, how in 30 days or 60 days, I can achieve great growth um, on LinkedIn because I think it's 18 months that you've really been pushing and you've got 65,000 followers on LinkedIn, which in the LinkedIn world yeah. is massive. Yes, yeah. So it's actually interesting because when I got started with LinkedIn, 
Um, there was sort of a combination of reasons um, as to why I actually started doing mm -hmm. it. I wasn't really in the content space, um, but one of the big drivers was sort of this fascination with, you know, spending time on Facebook and Instagram and so forth. I'm like, you know, there's all these people on there, you know, creating all this content and, you know, like why, why do people care? Like why, what makes people watch all this stuff? And not mm -hmm. to say that I didn't think the content was good, but I sort of just became very fascinated about that sort of concept. I'm like, okay, well, they're getting all these views and stuff like that, but what does that actually mean? And how does it work? And, you know, how does the performance of one video versus another compare? And like, yeah. why is one better than the other and so forth? So, um, for me, it was like sort of a personal development exercise, curiosity exercise. And I thought, you know, what? I'm going to start putting videos on LinkedIn because I don't really know anyone on LinkedIn. Because if I go onto Facebook, my mom's going to take the piss out of me. And my brother's going to take the piss out of me. And post, he'll post all these inappropriate comments on there. So yeah. I'm going to deal with that. So um, it was an Instagram. I was like, oh, Instagram's probably not the platform because even at that time, you know, uh, video and sort of Instagram TV and so forth, you know, like yeah, Instagram TV from memory actually at that time wasn't even launched yet. No. Um, and so video wasn't massive on Instagram. I was like, oh, I don't really fit into the Instagram mold, you know, because like, I'm not just going to doll myself up every time. I just, I just don't feel like it's right. So I was like, okay, I'll go to LinkedIn. And I already had a LinkedIn account, but <laughs> nothing on it. Um, and anyway, so I went on there, started posting videos. And so went in actually um, sort of blindfolded in the sense that I didn't know the video feature was very new to LinkedIn at mm -hmm. that time. So I think I'd gone on there about three months after they released it to everyone. Um, yep. So they'd completed all their, their beta testing and so forth. And I went on there um, and so I was just, just doing videos and seeing what would happen. And, you know, the first how many videos, no one really watches it or anything. You're like, oh, this is a bit awkward. Yeah. Um, and I didn't really know how to use LinkedIn. And then what happened is that, um, you know, as I started to build momentum through consistency, I was just consistently showing up to test things and whatnot. I started to sort of notice some patterns. So there was a lot of pattern recognition going on. I was like, okay, well, this is working. Okay, well, that's very quite quick. Okay, well, when I do that, for example, you know, respond to all the comments within the first hour and a half, you know, okay, well, the, the post performs a whole lot better and stuff like that. And okay, well, if I post at midnight, I'm capitalizing on the US audience mm -hmm. and then it's driving it up the feed in Australia the next day. So I just started noticing these little things. And um, I remember, uh, I think it was in the first, I want to say it was like the first 15 weeks or something I'd gotten to from memory, 33,000 followers thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, and the only reason I remember that is because um, the, the you got, Northern Hold on, you, 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 you reached that or you got to 33,000 followers? In 15 weeks, yeah. Yeah. Damn. So, <laughs> yeah. And so the NT News, yeah. they followed me for all the pizza stuff. They're like, oh, you know, she's not in pizza anymore. You've got to watch out for this one, right? So I was like, oh, wow. Okay, we look at it like that's quite significant. Yeah, that, 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 that's that. a lot. I mean, most people, I mean, LinkedIn um, has a feature when you've got up more than 500 and most people, yeah. So if you've got, if you've got anything more than like two or three or 5,000 followers on LinkedIn, it's equivalent to almost being like a blue tick on Instagram. So once you start hitting twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand, you know, you 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 the shit, you the bomb, um, which yeah. is amazing. <laughs> you the bomb. No, but also just take it back a little. And to anyone that was listening, Sally just dropped a couple of hints there on some major tips. And I'm hoping people have their pen and paper out for the LinkedIn game mm. there. Post at midnight gets the American um, audience, and then it pushes in yeah. live into your audience when you come online the next day. That is a great insight tip there as well mm. another one was making sure you hit back on the comments that you do get within the first 90 minutes this is a very similar um, niche or space within the instagram game that you get 60 minutes of trying to get a viral content and a, a response to a comment counts as much as a comment itself and people don't realize that so when mm. if someone says oh, i love it and they're great you go great i've got 20 comments yeah. automatically you should be going that should be 40 comments because i should be responding back and responding open-ended so I should be responding back to make sure that I drive them to respond back to me again. Because I say to a lot of yeah. people, some people go, oh, I don't want to do open-ended. I don't want to have a 20 comment. I don't want to have a 20 comment conversation with someone on social media. I said, the day you do that, you're actually going to start making money because all of a sudden, instead of having two comments, you've got 20 comments and more people are going to engage. And that's the engagement, the engagement percentage, and then fundamentally means where there's actually money on a brand. Yeah, and there's sort of two key things that you make a really good point. You know, one is that the algorithms love it. Um, yeah. You know, they love when you're responding to people. They qualify, you know, they classify it as quality content. There's quality conversations going on there. Um, but the other thing is that what you'll notice is over time as you build momentum and you start to become sort of um, a familiar face on a platform, I can't speak for Instagram and Facebook so much, mm -hmm. but certainly on LinkedIn, 
Um, but as you become start to become a familiar face, what people will realise is they'll go, okay, well, you know, Sally or Lawrence, they respond to their comments. Okay, well, I'm going to comment because I want to engage with them. So I have a chance of actually being able to converse with them, even if it's for, you know, 1.5 seconds or something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, a big thing for me, obviously, as you get more volume of comments, it is quite difficult, yep. um, you know, to, to deal with that. And you sort of have to learn to try and filter very, very quickly and go through and see, okay, who am I going to respond to and so forth. Um, particularly when you go back on a piece of content after it's been out there for, you know, several hours, maybe 10, 24 hours. Yep. Um, but one of the things on LinkedIn for me is very much come when I'm talking to people, often I'll sort of throw, uh, if, you know, we're having a bit of a back and forth uh, private message mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I don't have the capacity to continue that and do that a lot. Um, it'll be like, catch me in the comments, you know, yep. um, so you're just telling them, like, come to the comments. Um, one, obviously it benefits the piece of content for me, but two, it allows us to, you know, if we are going to connect and convert even if it's momentarily um, in a way where we've got um, you know I'm very like sort of agenda and task orientated yep. so it's like you know we've got an agenda like we've got a topic of conversation here we can quickly share our thoughts and have a chat about that um, and then we can go on to the next piece of content so yeah, it's really, really important. Um, is, there also, is there also another way, and, and I know it's, some people are going to find this weird, but it's just the way, unfortunately, with social media, by saying, hey, don't, don't message me, or let's not continue the message in the inbox, let's do it in the comments. It's a bit of a creep filter, you know, so you get rid of those, um, yeah. you know, the, the people you don't want to have sort of in your inbox or your DM, as they say in the Instagram game, you know, you want them like, hey, if you want to say something to me, you've got to say it publicly. And, and, and in the LinkedIn yeah. game, unfortunately, there's not, there's not as much faked accounts because it's linked back to actual real people, real people and real jobs. Um, you're going to have to go out of your way. And I don't think there's any value of having a fake LinkedIn account. So it's sort of, no. hey, if I you think, want to message um, me, do it publicly. Yeah. And the interesting thing on LinkedIn, right, is that I get this a lot. There are some conversations you might spark. And because it is that it's a professional platform mm -hmm. and therefore people are very mindful of what's on their profile, therefore who they're representing and yep. so forth. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some people who just quite frankly don't care and they'll just <laughs> behave in ways that you're like, this is absurd, you know? Yeah. And then if you call them out, they're going to lose their job or they're going to yeah. have no customers left. So, but certainly there are a lot of people where, even if it's not a controversial topic, um, I'll find that they will express their thoughts on the yep. video or respond to the question I ask the audience um, in private message because for them there's that, whether it's a level of comfort or they decide to open up about something that's quite personal or quite significant mm -hmm. or quite detailed, um, or further it's something that, yeah, they just don't want to broadcast because they know their employer's watching. So in that sense on LinkedIn, I think that sort of private messaging component is sort of um, you know, a good alternative for those people. So they can still engage with you, yeah. but it's not directly on the asset, um, which sometimes is, you know, a bummer. Like I remember there was one post I put out uh, just having a trying to create a balanced conversation around um, content engagement pods and pods and stuff like that. Yep. And um, yeah, sort of just I'm very um, sort of neutral about it and just like to think about it as objectively as possible. And so you know, sharing my thoughts on that and said, you know, well, um, I think it really depends on your objective on LinkedIn and as to whether or not you should use pods, for example, if it's from a business perspective, mm -hmm. well, pods probably aren't effective and sustainable because you can't actually measure the effectiveness of content and therefore you don't know where you should be adjusting your strategy. Yep. Um, but if it's personal branding strategy and, you know, you're just uh, trying to get sort of, you know, as many sort of like top line vanity metrics as you can, then pods are probably a great alternative. And anyway, the long story short of it is this woman had messaged me and sent me this massive detailed message about, yeah, how she, grateful she was that I just did that video, which I was quite neutral in, um, because she said, I've just realized, you know, and, and I thought it, but I sort of didn't go with my gut feeling. And, you know, someone had been charging her. She pay, was paying some company, a small scale company, mm -hmm. um, you know, to manage her content manager LinkedIn profile. And she's like, they've been, you know, like they're not giving me real results because I've just realized now having a look at, I can completely see that they're using a pod of some kind. So, yep. you know, things like that where you've created a conversation through content, someone wants to engage with it, but they're not comfortable to necessarily mm -hmm. share that. Um, it's still great to receive it in private message because for you as a content creator, it gives you a lot of feedback. Um, but at the same time, there are always uh, the, the ones that probably shouldn't be private messaging people because they ask you to, you know, marry them or, you know, oh, if I, you know, if I wasn't married, then <laughs> blah, 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 I'd do this. Like, whoa. <laughs> Unfortunately, work, man. Like, fuck. unfortunately, social media world has that across the across the board. It doesn't matter which <laughs> platform you're on. Unfortunately, so um, I, th I have seen some pages where the people actually share those those private ones publicly, especially if you're doing the LinkedIn game. Uh, like you said, 
you know, stop it or you'll get fired pretty much. Again, on the, on the conversation we just spoke in the last couple of minutes, there was three words that you'd mentioned that a lot of people that are listening might understand, some might not, and some of them are actually your real key points. They were the vanity, pods, and assets. So it was really interesting to see, um, Sally, when you spoke about assets and asset on the page. To anyone that's out there, when you say the word asset, it's something that's important, something that's worth something, that has a value to you. So an asset being a house, an asset being a business, it being a share or anything like that. Sally mentioned the asset actually being the content that you put on your page. And it's an amazing way of the way she was speaking about it, just showing that when I put two lines of content, whether it's a message in, or today about something, or I put a photo up, I understand it to be an asset back to my brand and my business. And it's a great way to think about it because people go out there and they just have, it's in the LinkedIn game now, people in the LinkedIn yeah. game or in Instagram or Facebook game. And they go and say two week, uh, two uh, sentence line or put a photo up and not have that correlation of what that means back to their personal brand or the business they represent. Remember, yeah. if you say something on LinkedIn, doesn't matter if you're not um, self-employed, you still represent a company when people go in. If you have a shitty day and you have a shitty comment, People want to go into you and go, hey, this guy represents this company and therefore is, you know, it's a bad name for their company. So you've got to understand that it is an asset and look at it as in that worth. Second one that you raised up was pods. This That's big at the moment. So to anyone that doesn't understand something called pods or engagement pods or group of people that are like-minded or trying to support each other grow in their channel. So these exist across all social media platforms. Again, it's depending on your opinion on whether they're good or bad or and so forth. Some social media um, agencies or social media platforms are trying to ban them. But pretty much what it does is you get about 15, 20, 50 people that go and help each other by engaging on this post. And as Sally said, in the LinkedIn world, it won't give you as much benefit because even if you get in 30 likes and 30 comments on those parts from a LinkedIn world, it doesn't tell you if your business is effective or not. Because in LinkedIn world, you want to grow it to get to a wider reach so you can actually sell your services more in a business way. In the Instagram game, there's just an analytical game. If you can get a thousand likes and a thousand comments, doesn't matter where it comes from, you can sell your page. So it's a little bit softer in the Instagram game um, to LinkedIn. And then the third one was obviously vanity, using the word vanity. Doing posts to get vanity likes or numbers. So again, talking about, hey, I'm just doing this because I want the likes or comments means you're doing the content for the wrong reason on the LinkedIn platform. Because there you've got to be able to do it for the effective reason of understanding is, is it effective for my business, my brand, and what I'm representing, not just chasing 10,000 likes or 10,000 comments. So I just want to know what uh, your thoughts were on those three points, Sally. Yeah, I think you explained them better than I probably could. <laughs> <laughs> it's helpful. Um, I've got like my mental notes going. I'm like, yeah, yeah that's a good way to explain that. Um, but certainly, yeah. And I mean, with content, you know, referring to them as assets, I don't even know when or why I just started doing that. I'm like, oh, content assets. Can you know, so many people actually interested in this set? Like, so what's an asset? Content asset. I'm like, oh, it's just a piece of content, but it is an asset, you know, um, in essence. Um, and it's in day one, essentially. I remember the first keynote I did on LinkedIn um, and it was about two or three months in and I thought I'm totally out of my league here. I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm just going to wing it. And you know, when I was doing some thinking before this keynote, I thought, okay, like, what am I really doing? You know, and what does each piece of content actually mean? I was like, okay, well, it's an asset. And the other word I like to use to describe the, um, the, the power of content, if you like, or the purpose of it, like it compounds in nature. So, mm -hmm. You know, really important thing to think about. Yes, momentum dies down. Yes, you know, for example, on LinkedIn, after 24 hours, the, the asset's naturally going to start sort of filtering out the news feed because it's not hot off the press and so forth. Yep. Um, except in cases where you can get some sort of, um, you know, whether it's complete virality or somewhere along those lines and you build sort of really, really good um, exposure and engagement with it. But, um, you know, asset, like the content assets compound in nature in the sense that, yes, you put, you know, say a video out today, you might monitor it closely for the first 24 hours, then you monitor it sort of a little bit for the remainder of the week. Um, but even post that week, if you were to never look at that video again, it's still like compounding in nature in terms mm -hmm. of the impact that has, because it's still playing around in the background. People are still going to consume that, um, that video asset, particularly on platforms where, um, you know, the, the feeds, if you like, and the profiles are optimized for creators, our content yep. creators. 
Um, you know, for example, namely Facebook and Instagram, so forth. I couldn't comment on too many others. LinkedIn isn't that optimized for content creators. So for example, when you go to someone's profile, um, you can't sort of sort through their content in a very organized manner. They're taking slow steps to get there by creating different tabs. Um, but I suppose in essence, it's important to acknowledge that, yeah, those assets will continue compounding in the background. And if you look at traditional marketing, it was, oh, it takes on average seven to eight impressions for someone to feel comfortable, um, you know, potentially making a purchasing decision with you. Uh, you know, the digital world has completely flipped that on its head and it's somewhere yep. in the vicinity now estimated to be, it takes 26 to 27 impressions for that same level of comfort to be developed. Um, but I think at the same time, that comfort, once it is developed, is probably a lot stronger um, just on the basis of how we actually communicate with each other through uh, content and so forth. Um, but if you're, you never know which asset could be that, you know, that 26th or that 27th impression, even though you posted it three months ago, yeah. that could be the one asset that gets someone across the line to go, you know what, I'm going to contact Lawrence and I want to have a chat to him about X, Y, Z. There was one example in the early days for me on LinkedIn um, that really highlighted that. Um, and it was with um, the marketing manager from uh, a Qantas Ventures marketing team in Sydney. And um, anyway, and he contacted me saying, you know, I'd love you to come in and do a session with our marketing team on LinkedIn and so forth and personal branding for themselves as individuals, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, because I was watching this video and, you know, mm-hmm. you said ABC. And at the time that he messaged me, that video was, you know, a month and a half old. And I was like, well, this really highlights the importance of not undervaluing the content, um, yep. even if it's not the best performing. So, yeah, certainly they are assets for sure. And then pods, as you said, it's, I think it really depends on your objective at the end of the day um, and just being mindful of how you do use them um, so you don't find yourself in a sticky situation. Um, you know, it's interesting, I think, in the paid landscape, if you look at the likes of Facebook, you know, they're quite proactively trying to ban paid advertisers who use, um, you know, pod-like mm-hmm. approaches um, with their paid advertising because of the, you know, they go, well, is it ethical, you know, the manipulation, the deception and so forth. So I think that's going to be an interesting yeah. space in the so next that, couple of months, certainly. It is interesting you just mentioned about the historical and the compound of the content. I just had a discussion a couple of hours ago with someone and when we had that exact discussion, we produced content. I can tell you it was um, June last year. We produced the content. That content is out now in the market. And she only just recently, due to that content, had signed a customer directly related to that piece of content we produced, was that seven, seven months ago, had that person went back seven months, find the piece of content in their research, and then signed the business deal. So again, as you said, is make sure when you do it, do it effective in the right way. And don't just forget about it. You can, you know, let it do its way, but you never know when that one piece can come back and go viral or produce business from it. Because nothing stops a piece of content that's two years old going viral because someone might have said something two years ago and then someone publicly went and said the exact same thing and there's a correlation to it. But yeah. one thing, um, as much as we're talking quite in depth about LinkedIn and so forth, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and just spend some basic insights into the LinkedIn game to anyone that's listening. Um, so for one example, if we use two examples. For one example, like myself, I have a day job, which is unfor- which is totally different to what I do on the podcast series. So to anyone that's listening, I might be surprised, but yes, I do have a nine to five and I do the podcast brand as, as, well, as well. So the two don't correlate to each other. So there's a challenge. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are doing a side business, a side hustle, in the LinkedIn space, from your experiences, what is the best manner how to manage content around that, messaging around that, and also would you recommend that the person stands up a brand separate page away from their sort of day to nine to five image page? I'll answer the last question first, so yeah. that, because that one's a lot shorter. Um, but in terms of yeah, the, the profiles, uh, a lot of people have asked that actually. You'd be surprised how common that question is. Oh, mm-hmm. should I have two profiles? You mm-hmm. know, and so forth. Um, I always say no. Um, one, because, you know, whether it's Google or LinkedIn, um, and LinkedIn actually ranks very highly on um, Google search. Mm-hmm. Um, did you, I think it was in April this year, LinkedIn was um, uh, officially the 23rd or 21st most visited website in the world. Um, mm-hmm. So that's something to take away and think about if you're not yet using LinkedIn. Um, but in terms of creating sort of two profiles and so forth, you know, the internet in essence really doesn't like duplicate content. So that's something to think about. Um, not to say it would pick up on it very quickly, uh, but certainly something to think about. The other thing is time management with that. It can become a bit of a headache, I can imagine. 
Um, and in terms of page versus profile as well, for example, if you're building say a side hustle or a business or you've got, um, you know, um, a hobby that could become a business or mm-hmm. is becoming a business on the side, say a podcast, um, you know, you don't want to run it through a company page because by default company pages get lower performance um, because LinkedIn wants you to pay for yeah. advertising, right? Mm-hmm. And you can't pay for advertising through a personal profile. Um, so certainly stick with a personal profile simply on the basis of the, um, the, the performance you'll be able to unlock for yourself. Um, and you're positioned a lot better to take advantage of LinkedIn in that sense. Um, and in terms of managing it, look, I think there's no one answer for everyone. And the reason I say that in particular is because if you look at employers, for example, you know, every employer is so different. You find some employers who are really open to it. They lo- they would love the idea of all of their employees or all of their team being quite, you know, vocal and quite prolific online. But then you've also got, um, which is the majority, the other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, we have a 37-page uh, social media, um, you know, policy. Yep. And, you know, you've got to be careful and so forth. And so in that sense, I would never sit there and I never throw out advice and say, look, this is stock standard. Everyone should listen to this. Um, I think it's very contextually relevant. Um, I think other things that are a bit softer and not so formal, you know, what is your relationship like with your employer? Mm-hmm. Who is your employer? What's the size of your employer? Because, for example, if it's a small-scale startup or maybe a medium-sized business, they could potentially really benefit from you becoming quite prolific and building your personal brand yep. um, in terms of lead generation brand awareness. But conversely, if it's a larger company, maybe they're in that sort of dinosaur thinking that, no, this is our social media policy and we can't have you say anything in the case that it reflects poorly on us, which touches on what we spoke about earlier. So usually I think, um, you know, in cases where, say you do start building a profile and you start to build quite a bit of momentum, if you have that relationship with your, your employer or your line manager, I'd always recommend try and keep the communication lines open. And just even if it's as simple as, hey, you know, if there's ever anything that sort of makes you feel uncomfortable, you think I should be a little bit careful about, um, you know, just in terms of how it might reflect on the company, let me know. Um, I mean, that's sort of best case scenario. Um, but other than that, if you maybe don't have that relationship or you're not comfortable having that relationship as of yet, or you don't think it's worthy to have that relationship yet, certainly the best place to start is by just looking at things that, so in terms of creating content, looking and going, okay, well, what are my experiences been professionally or what am I currently doing or what are challenges I go through and how can I turn those into um, like content assets in a storytelling way um, yeah. that doesn't necessarily reflect explicitly on the company or maybe I can talk about, you know, I can go, okay, well, I had a um, challenging experience managing a relationship with a client. What was the biggest thing I learned from that? Okay, maybe the biggest thing you learned, I'm going to be real basic here, was patience. <laughs> okay, so maybe I can just write something or, you know, do a video talking about the importance of patience. Um, and that was really where I got started with my content creation journey as well. Um, and a lot of people don't know that is that I was in a space where I didn't have a commercial agenda. I wasn't trying to sell anything. I wasn't trying to build a business, so to speak. I was, so all I could think of was, well, all I can really talk about is things from personal experience. You yep. know, think about things like go through, dissect them. Don't give away specifics. Don't mention names. Don't say when it was necessarily, yep. but take away the key learning and then turn that into a piece of content. Um, and so usually that's just a few words. It could be patience. It could be, you know, culture. It could be um, self-care, you know, and finding a way to start building your personal brand around that. Because even though your business may not be in, you know, um, for example, like, teen culture sort of strategy and so forth um, and that's not your brand um, but what you're doing is using your existing expertise interests, mm-hmm. experiences to create content in a way that's relatable for people and it's not too much um, of a tall order for you to produce because you're talking from personal experience so um, and I- even if it doesn't necessarily speak directly to what you do for a living in yep. your job um, you know for example uh, to give a quick example without rambling on that one too long was I was actually on a coaching call yesterday and this woman, uh, she works in a, you know, national, uh, sorry, no, an account director role, so an account management role. And, um, you know, her goal is eventually to get to national level in terms of, you know, account management, account directorship and so forth. Um, and so the, the strategy for her is like, okay, well, you don't necessarily want to make a place that you're potentially going to be headhunted or whatever the yep. scenario is. Um, but what you can do in that scenario, if you are employed and you don't necessarily want to build your own business, but you want to build your personal brand and you want to keep growing corporately, is dissect and go, okay, well, based on the job title that I eventually want to assume or where I want to get to, what are the key skills and characteristics that are required for me to be able to do that job? And how can I create content around that off the back of my experiences to create demonstration mm-hmm. in the market, prove to people that I know those things or I'm aware of yep. those things and so forth. So 
yeah, so just, yeah, I hope that kind of makes sense. It's such a big question. Yeah. Such a big I, I, question. I totally does. You did. You went through about three different paths. With three, you answered about three different questions that I hadn't actually asked, which was great <laughs> anyway. So, but the last point of the gap analysis and understanding where you want to go in a future job and actually almost advertising the gap and um, the gap that you see that you have that skill set is an amazing way to do it. And something I have actually not thought of. To anyone listening, make sure you pay attention to what you said. Is if you wanted to be two or three or four levels above. But you weren't actually wanting to chase it per se or put up a social brand is go and advertise or go and message and communicate on linkedin and use the platform showing you've got those skills so if someone comes back and does the research they can see you've already got the skills between where you are now and where you want to be and it was yeah, great yeah. the rest of the, uh, the answers you put, uh, spoke about there about the relationship between you and your company the lead generation as well that was in there at the moment and depending on yourself over in a personal to a private page about um brand pages having to pay for sponsored private pages you don't and so forth. I think that is a great amount of content and some great insights that you brought into the listeners today. And I think it's a great point where we would end it off today because if anyone is still interested and want more, I don't want to take customers away from you or future customers away from you, Sally. So before we end it off, um, because this is fundamentally what Sally does. That's so. actually another conversation <laughs> in and of itself, something yeah. I always get from people, especially entrepreneurs here, yeah. business owners, but like, can I share all this value and content because then I'm going to render myself useless and no one will pay me. I'm like, no, trust me. You add to the value chain. Yep. You know, you add value, build value around you, yourself because what most people want help with is the, um, in the, not in a disrespectful way, people want, even myself with certain things that I engage people for, mm-hmm. you want help with the hand holding, the ongoing coaching, the ongoing, yep. you know, execution support. So, um, yeah, anyway, I won't remember what that is. No, uh, look, yeah, I, conversation. yeah, I was going to, I was going to say, look, yeah, I've, you know, I've got to say in a sense of we've got to leave a little bit in the tank because otherwise me and Sally yeah. will be sitting here for five hours and you guys will be mm-hmm. really, really bored. <laughs> Um, about further information. Everything's out there. But before we end it off today, Sally, can you please let the listeners know where they can find you, um, your handles and so forth? Yeah. Um, so on LinkedIn, Sally A. Illingworth. Instagram, I shouldn't, Facebook is certainly Sally A. Illingworth as well. Um, and then my Instagram, I think the handle is Sally Illingworth. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you search out Sally A. Illingworth, you'll be able to find it. So LinkedIn certainly um, is where I am the most. And I probably produce or share the most amounts of like substanceful content. Um, but Instagram, as Lawrence would know, is where I'm a little bit more funny and whatever. Well, I think I'm funny. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, and then I've got sallyillingworth.com as well. Um, but usually on social media channels, it's the best place to find me. Um, and then if it is for a business or potential engagement or coaching support, whatever the scenario, um, you can, we can have that conversation on social media, migrate it offline. Um, so, yeah. Well, thanks for having well, me, Lawrence. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks so much, um, Sally, and thanks so much for the handles. And as always, with the rest of the episodes, I'll put those links once I produce the podcast on the social platform so people can see that as well. And to anyone else, um, everyone else that's listening, either on the audio podcast or the YouTube video series, thank you so much for coming over um, again to the Wolf of Queen Street. And as I always said before, I don't charge anything. I don't want anything. But other than if you enjoy this episode, all I ask is you tell one friend or one person to come over and see what we're trying to do here and trying to change people's lives by giving them content and knowledge. But at the end of the day, have a beautiful and powerful day, and we'll see you later. Cheers. Bye.